Well, good morning. Welcome to Willow Creek. Let's go ahead and stand together. Hope you had a good holiday week, a good break. We're excited to worship with you this morning. There's joy in this place. Amen. Here we go. Come on.
the king of my heart Be the shadow where I hide The ransom for my life Oh, he is my son And you are good You're good Oh, and you are good You're good
joining us online. Well, I just want to be vulnerable for a second, be honest. Leading up to this morning, uh, you'd never know, but we've had some adversity this morning. Some sickness that came around that took some people out, but thank God some other people were just able to step in. Some other things that have just been coming against us this morning, and I just want to be honest, we just stopped for a moment. We just prayed in the mighty name of Jesus. We come against the enemy. But I want to be real with you in that moment, you know, thinking about this song specifically. You're never going to let me down. I've, I've talked before about that where maybe at times you feel like, well, yeah, God does let me down. He didn't, he didn't answer my prayer the way I wanted him to. He didn't come through the way I wanted him to. And yet you look at it, and it's actually he will never let us down, but our expectations of God can let us down, right? But his goodness does not fail. His goodness does not change. And in that moment this morning when it's just like everything is like coming against us, we can have a choice right there, right? We can have the choice. Be like, you know what, God? What the heck? Why are you letting this happen? And be angry and come against it. And maybe just say, you know what? We're not gonna have service this morning. Just walk out. You been there before? You have been there before in your life where maybe something's coming against you and you're just like ready to give it up? Or the harder thing to do is what James 1 tells us. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you experience trials of many kind. Because when you walk through it, your perseverance in it reveals faith. You gotta have faith, right? So this morning, you know what, we're like, you know what? God is good. He's going to show up. If we got to do kumbaya, we're going to do kumbaya. Let your will be done, Lord, right? So what is that in your life? Yeah. As we pray, let's go ahead and close our eyes. As we pray, when we go into this new year, maybe it's a perspective shift that we need. Maybe it's a heart shift that we need to say, you know what? last two years have not been what we had hoped, right? Our expectations of God might be a little jaded. But God's mercies and his grace are new every morning. And he loves you and he cares about you and he knows all the stuff that you've gone through. And he is right here in this place with us. God, thank you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you that you were already here before we got here. God, you already knew what this day held. And yet on our end to come in and to have faith and to believe and sing some lyrics that are about you, that remind us of who you are, that you're our champion. You have overcome the world. And we can lean in on that and we can trust in that. We thank you for that, Jesus. We thank you for that. I pray that those that are in here and those online that have experienced you this morning, God, would you bless them? Would you bless them, wrap them up? And as we go into this new year, God, let our perspectives be changed that no matter what comes against us, no matter what storms come against us, no matter what sickness comes against us, God, you are powerful, you are still in control, and you are sovereign, and you are faithful, and you are good. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Amen. Can we praise and thank our God this morning? Amen. I snuck up behind him. <laughs> Good morning, Willow. So good to see you guys this morning. You can have a seat. Thank you for being here. You are some brave and adventurous souls to come out in the snow, and I am so glad that you are here. So welcome, and a warm welcome to those of you who are online, and are, or maybe you're going to brave it out and come next service. I would love to see that. So welcome. Thank you for being here. Whether you've been here for a long time or you're new here to Willow, we just want to say thank you, and we'd love to get to know you. So please take some time to stop back at our Next Step Hub and say hi to us and find Find out a little bit more about what's going on. Another way that I'd love to see many of you get connected is with our Welcome to Willow event that's coming up in just two weeks. So this is not just if you're brand new. This is also if you've been here for a while and you're just really longing to get a new view or a new vision of what we're doing here at Willow Crystal Lake. If you just kind of want to get a behind the scenes take on what's happening here, maybe you want to get to know some of the staff or just hear a little bit more about ways that you can get connected here 
at the church, we want to welcome you. It is in two weeks. It's on uh, January 16th. It is from 4 to 6 p.m. And you can register for the event that just helps us kind of know how many to prepare for at willowcreek.org slash welcome. So please consider coming, bringing others who might be interested in getting connected, and just let us uh, show you a, a fun time, a, a welcoming time, and get to know us a little bit better. So please consider that. So we've just stepped out of a really super busy season, right? The last, I don't know, for me, six, eight weeks maybe of Christmas and holidays and all the different things that have been happening around the church. You know that we had an, a great party on December 19th, the Christmas Express, and hopefully many of you were there. There was over 450 young and old and all kinds of wonderful ways of connecting, lots of fun and joy. But Christmas isn't always feel super fun, and maybe some of you guys have experienced a little bit of that this year. I know I did. Um, but you guys were there um, in serving our community and in helping. We gave um, gifts to over 100 kids who had a parent that's incarcerated. We served Canterbury and Lundahl schools through Christmas giving and gift cards. And we had another thing happen that many of you may know, but you might not know, that two times a month on the first and on the third Friday each month, we have this event, and it's called the Empower Shower. It's a community event, but it happens right here at Willow Crystal Lake. And what it is, is we have, I don't know, a dozen to 16 different agencies and churches and uh, groups that come alongside. They come and help uh, those who are experiencing un um, homelessness or those who are at risk at being becoming unsheltered. And this is just a great way for us to love on our community. We have dozens of people who come every time and who experience the love of Christ through finding services through for addiction or housing or rental assistance. They get health care help. We, we give them a gift card almost every time, a little gift card for food at a local restaurant. We also feed a warm um, lunch. They've had opportunities for flu shots and COVID shots and so much more. They're able to get a shower, thus the Empower Shower um, name of it. But we are just so happy. Even this last, um, the last one right before Christmas, we had kind of thrown out a net asking just for gift cards to Walmart to be able to gift $25. That's a pretty big deal if you're hurting it during Christmas. And just an overflowing response of those who, who gave and served. And so we were able to give everybody who came a Christmas card with a Christmas wish and a $25 gift card to Walmart so that they could go and celebrate with their families. And so I just want to say thank you. That kind of stuff doesn't happen in isolation. It happens when a community like you come together and we have the opportunity to serve those around us. So thank you so much. If this is something, if um, taking a step towards being a part of generosity here at Willow Crystal Lake is something new to you, I just want to invite you to take a step today. There are some blue boxes in the back of the, the room by the entrances that you could drop off a, a gift to, to serve um, here at Crystal Lake. Or you can go to willowcrystallake.org slash give. Or if you're watching with us online, you can just go to the give button. There's lots of ways just to become a, involved in giving here at Crystal Lake. And it lets you be a part of all the many things that are happening. And if it feels hard to give like online, you can stop back at the next step booth as well and they can help you get the app or go online or whatever and figure it out if it's for the first time so we really invite you to do that so we're getting ready to start a new series where well, we're doing a new year new view and we have a whole bunch of wonderful new um conversations to have to move us into this next year. But before we do let's pray together and just ask God to have his hands all over what we're doing today so let's pray. God, we are grateful, Father, that you've allowed us to gather here today in person and online. Thank you for each heart that is here today. God, I just pray that uh, you would give us individually ears to hear and collectively, Father, as a church, give us ears, give us eyes to see, give us courage to obey you in the hard things and in the everyday things. God, have your way among us today. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Julie. 
Well, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the year 2022. Um, yeah, yeah, welcome. And I want to just begin by congratulating everyone here today for having perfect attendance so far this year. Way to go, okay. And also everyone watching online, if you're engaged online, welcome. Um, 2021 is gone, guys. It's gone. We'll never see 2021 again. Uh, we are now in the year 2022, and I'm all excited. And I know, I don't know about you, but there's always like excitement in the new year. There's energy that just naturally happens. You want to start something new. You got like excited. Hey, I'm going to better myself somehow. I'm going to sign up for something. I'm going to subscribe to something. Hey, how about a new diet plan, a new exercise regimen? Maybe you've already started to do that, or maybe you're like so many other people where you always start Monday. Is that, is that work? It's like, okay, it's the weekend. I'm going to start Monday. That's the time because it just works better, right? Whatever it is, hey, I'm all for that. Set some goals, get excited, better yourself. Like, man, I'm for all those things. But before any of that new you starts to happen, right? The new year, new you. Before any of that happens, we need to have a new view. We need to have a new view. So that's why the, the message today is titled New Year, New View. It's critical for us to have the right view before we step into any kind of action or any kind of goal or anything like that. We have to have the right view. And all throughout the Bible, all throughout Scripture, you see people who go through difficult circumstances and situations but there are some who just had a different view as they went through it. And I just want to mention one today. In the Old Testament, um, the nation of Israel, um, they had a temple, uh, they had a home, and the Babylonians came and destroyed it. And they took many captive. They were exiles. Daniel, if you know the story of Daniel, he was one of those. Um, and they, they, they destroyed this, this nation, right, the home and temple, they destroyed it, took them captive, and for decades, right, for decades, they, they were in exile. They were in Babylon, and it was difficult. It was hard. And as the nation kind of went through this where they had a temple, and then it was destroyed, and then it was leader after leader. After decades, they went back home. They were now able to go back home, but it wasn't very easy to return. It was leader after leader after leader. First Zerubbabel, then Ezra, then this guy named Nehemiah comes in and they all help to restore this nation, to rebuild the temple, the community, and the wall, and rebuild stability within the nation. And so at one point, the nation was blessed, then they were broken, and then they had to rebuild. But let me just say this real quick. This is often kind of the, the progression um, where we have these experiences. Um, and let me just read really quickly um, the, the beginning of, of Nehemiah chapter 1. Let me just read it so you can kind of hear uh, the tone of Nehemiah as people came. And again, a message came to him. He got a DM from people and they said, hey, here's what's going on still. Uh, back home, and here's what it says in Nehemiah 1, verses 3 through 4. They said to me, those who survive the exile, that is, they said to Nehemiah, and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. He was hurting. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. See, the nation of Israel went through a difficult season. Certainly, Nehemiah felt the hurt and the pain that came from this season. Babylon came and destroyed it all. So they were blessed, they were broken, and then they rebuilt. Here's the progression. Everyone lean into this. This is what I often see in life, okay, the progression we all go through. We have... Then we hurt, then we heal. We have, then we don't have, so we hurt. Then we heal. We have something, it's good. Then we go through an experience, it's taken, it's destroyed something, we lose something, and we hurt. And then we go and we try to heal from it. 
This is often the progression I see all the time in life. In fact, even Jesus went through this where he lived, he died, and he resurrected. This is what we call the gospel, where Jesus came, lived, died, and resurrected from the grave. And it's my experience where I often see people not able to step into that third step, that third phase where we're coming out of hurt and into healing. It is very difficult. We have, and then we hurt because we don't have it anymore. We lost it or something changed and we hurt and that's good and necessary. We mourn through those seasons but it's so hard to get to that healing place. And I see this often all the time where we have and we're on the mountaintop and then we hurt in the valley and then a new season comes, a new year with new opportunities and new goals. And so often I see we can't quite accomplish what God's called us to do because we're still hurting. We never cross over to that healing and so we get stuck and we live far below our means of what we could ever accomplish for God. And this is what happened with the nation of Israel where they had and then they hurt and now they're trying to heal and Zerubbabel, Ezra and Nehemiah, they're all trying to restore stability back to the people and, and, and it's difficult. And we all go through these seasons as well. We have and we hurt and we try our best to heal. But how many of you guys know that the Old Testament and what the stories that we read about so often is reaffirmed in the New Testament, where the New Testament is kind of like an affirmation, a fulfillment, a completion of what was said in the Old Testament. And so I want to give sort of a holistic view today uh, from Nehemiah through the New Testament and all that kind of happened and see if we can get some new views today. So see, when we go into the Old Testament and we read stories in the New Testament, we see the fulfillment actually happen. Even Jesus mentions this whole temple being destroyed in John 2 when he actually brings up, he says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll rebuild it. It's almost like he's paralleling the story of Nehemiah to himself and what he's going to go through. So I want to read and look at a passage in the New Testament where someone who went through a season where they had and they hurt and then they healed and the view that they had throughout. Because if we're going to go into this new year and accomplish all that God has called us to accomplish, we need and must have the right view. So I want to give a few new year, new views today. And I want to look at a passage in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 50. I got a lot of Bible today, so listen fast. But if you have a Bible, you can turn there, you can turn it on. Luke chapter 8, verses 40. Here's what it says. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowd's almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, mm -mm, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she, should, she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. All right, we're going to get into this. Notice this real quick, a little extra note here. Uh, Jesus is on his way to see about Jairus' daughter, and it's on the way that something powerful happens. So note this down. Sometimes we get caught up with the destination, I can't wait for 2021 to be over and 2022 to begin. I can't wait to just graduate. 
I can't wait to get married one day. I can't wait to have kids one day. I can't wait for my kids to go to college. I can't wait for my kids to come back home from college. I can't wait for COVID to be over and the mandates to be over. But just note this down. It's just a side note. It's in the journey, not the destination, that we find something significant. Please note this down as we're going through this progression where we have hurt and heal and we're living this out. It is always, in my experience, in the journey, not in the destination, that we find something significant. So everyone say it's in the journey. It's in the journey. Yes, it's in the journey. If you're watching online, just put it in the chat. It's in the journey where we find something significant. So let me give you just a few new year, new views that we can learn today. Lean in carefully. The first view is this. We need to have a new view of self. A new view of self. In this passage that I just read, the woman is unnamed. Instead, listen, she's known by her problem. She's known by her problem and it becomes sort of this identity that swallows her up. She is known as the woman with the issue. The woman with the issue of blood. That's her identity. You see, sometimes we rehearse the problem more than the promises of God. You ever notice that? Often we see this where we rehearse the problem more than the promises of God. And whenever we talk more about the problem than the promise, the problem gets magnified. The problem becomes the thing that we're focused on and it becomes big. So just note this down if you're taking notes today. We get more of whatever we magnify. We get more of whatever we magnify, whether it's right or wrong. We get more of whatever we magnify. So what gets celebrated, good or bad, gets repeated. What gets repeated becomes the culture that we live in each and every day. That's what gets magnified. So let me ask this question. What have you been magnifying? What have you been praising? What have you been celebrating? What have you been repeating? Chances are that's what you're getting more of, and it could be encroaching on your Identity, but come on, let's give her a break, right? Can you blame her? She had this issue for 12 years, 12 years. I mean, we've been in this pandemic for a couple of years now. Can you imagine the same problem, 12 years? That's what this woman was dealing with. But on top of that, lean into this, the law declared her unclean. The law in this day declared her unclean. What does that mean? It means that this issue that she dealt with separated her from her family, from her friends, and from her community. So she was a lifelong quarantine. That's what she was in, in complete isolation. And she didn't have Zoom, and she didn't have opportunities to watch online and stay connected. She was completely alone disconnected from the world. She was isolated. In Mark 5, it actually describes it in a really interesting way. It said, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. You see, at some point, listen, at some point, she had relationships, she had money, she had things, And it was all taken away. And now she's hurting. And what view did she take on? What did that do to her? Listen, it made her desperate. It made her desperate. She became desperate. There's something about desperation that pushes us. Pushes us to do more than we ever thought we could. When we're desperate, we're going to shed those pounds. When we're desperate, we're going to wake up early. When we're desperate, we come to church in the middle of a snowstorm, right? When we're desperate, we come to church differently altogether with expectation. When we're desperate, we're going to serve our families. When we're desperate, we go beyond what we ever thought we could. It's as if desperation is the door that breakthrough walks through. 
And in so many ways, we ought to view desperation as a gift. Why? Because desperation will open doors that complacency will keep shut. Write that one down. Desperation will open doors that complacency will keep shut. The woman with the issue, listen, ran out of options. She is all alone down to her very last. Sometimes we don't believe God when we have options. Sometimes we just don't. We don't believe God when we have options. It's difficult to believe God for things that we can do for ourselves. And sometimes he allows every door to close, listen, so that we can view ourselves and him appropriately and effectively. Jesus said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 19 and Luke 18. It is for this very reason. Let me take this further. There are people in the world today that have to believe God every day for water. I'm going to admit to you, I've never had in my entire life, I've never had to believe God for water. I've always had a kitchen sink nearby and access to water. Don't get me wrong. I am grateful for water. I am grateful for the things and I praise God and thank him for all he's provided me. But I've never actually had to pray for water. See, faith is born when man's ability fails. That's when faith erupts. Faith starts at the point of human limitation. It's very difficult, not impossible, but it's very difficult to believe God for what we can already do for ourselves. Most of us did not pray for God to brush our teeth or dress us or get us out of bed. Even the atheist, the person who doesn't believe God exists, even the atheist can do all that. Most of us, we don't pray about the things that are within our ability to perform and and capacity to perform and live out, but you really start believing God in a new way when you have run out of options and have only him to depend on. When we are desperate, it's like the apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians, for when I am weak, then he is strong. Then he is strong. So let me just Rhetorical question, are you feeling weak today? Are you feeling just like you've hit rock bottom? Well, if that's you, then you are just right for God. You're becoming desperate for him and needing to rely on him. Praise God if that's where you are. We need a new view of self as we step into this new year. Praise God if you're desperate and that's where you are today. So we need a new view of self, but listen, we also need a new view of others. We need a new view of others. If we're going to go through this progression where we have, we hurt, and we heal, we need to have a new view of others. Listen really carefully. Jairus came. Jairus came to Jesus because his 12-year-old daughter, as it reads, was dying. So Jesus began to make his way to Jairus' house, right? But then Jesus was interrupted by someone else. Did you read that? Jesus was interrupted by someone else. So Jesus stops, who touched me? Now listen, if you're Jairus the father, you're you're going, are you kidding me right now, Jesus? Everybody's touching you. Peter, talk to your boy. Everyone's touching you, Jesus. I mean, you, you have to be in the mind of Jairus where your daughter is dying, you're the father, you're the parent. Come on, Jesus. And then this woman cuts in line. And in other translations, it says, and she tells her whole story. If you're Jairus, you're going, come on, woman, get your healing and go. Come on, Jesus, where'd you go? Oh, my goodness, you're in a conversation. Come on, Jesus, right? Can you see this, like, impatient father moment? You, that if I was there, I'm going, Jesus, 
I mean, I'm like pulling him. I'm like, don't, you don't let go of me, Jesus. Like, let's go. I mean, this is where Jairus is at. And then this woman tells her whole story, and you're Jairus, you're going, come on, come on, come on. Oh my goodness, my daughter, my daughter is literally on her deathbed right now. We don't have time for this. So listen real carefully to this. Jairus had to wait on his blessing, on his healing. He had to wait. And if that's not frustrating enough, it's having to wait on your healing, on your blessing, while someone else gets theirs. Oh man, that's rough. That's hard. How many of us can relate to that moment? We watch people get a promotion while you just lost your job. We watch people post pictures on Instagram of their new baby where you are still trying to get pregnant. You watch people get married while you're still single. You watch people survive a sickness while you've lost loved ones to it. Sometimes it's really hard. It's really hard to view others the right way. But then the worst happens. Oh, man. Something no parent ever wants to hear. While Jesus was speaking with the woman and Jairus was eagerly awaiting, someone came from his house to tell him that his daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Man, J Jairus might have been thinking like so many of us probably would have been thinking, if you wouldn't have stopped Jesus, if it wasn't for this woman, Jesus, perhaps my daughter would have been saved. Perhaps my daughter would be alive today. Why did you let that happen, God? Why would you let Babylon thrive and Jerusalem be destroyed, the people of God be destroyed and taken captive? Why would you allow Jairus' daughter to die and this woman get healed? So write this down. It's easy for us to view someone else's blessing, compare it to our burden, and become bitter. That happens so quickly. As you're going through this process where you have and you hurt and you're trying to heal, it is so easy for us to view someone else's blessing, compare it to our burden, our hurt, our pain, and immediately become bitter. Done. I'm done. I'm done with church. I'm done with God. And walk away. How we view others while we are hurting can be so difficult, which is why we need a new view. When God works in others, we need to change our view of others. Let me be more personal. When God does something at another campus and not on our campus, praise God, because we're one church. When God does something to your neighbor who actually curses God, and has, doesn't care about church, doesn't care about a relationship with God, and blesses him but not you. We need to have a new view of others. So let me just say, Jesus stopping to help this woman was not to discourage Jairus. It was to remind him that God has the power. It was to encourage him that God can do the impossible. Notice, G Notice this small little thing that we tend to read past. Notice that Jesus calls the woman, listen, daughter. Nowhere else in scripture does Jesus call anyone by this name. He says, daughter, daughter. Certainly was to show her like a, a tender, loving word. But it was also as if to hint at Jairus, I can heal this daughter. Don't worry about yours. And when someone's life is changed, even though ours has not, that should act as a reminder that God is still on the throne. That God is still working, that even in a pandemic, hundreds can be blessed through our empowered shower. That over 400 can be baptized in one year. That 4,000 people being connected in a group can still happen in a pandemic because God is on the throne. That even when the world is weary and lost, God is able. God is able.
It's not to discourage you. It's to encourage you. It's to remind you. And it may not be done in the same way. So don't look at this and say, well, they got a house, so I'm going to get a house in the same neighborhood with the same square footage. And Jesus, I'm going to measure. No, 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 no. God often works in different ways with different people in different kinds of times. But he can do it nevertheless. And Jesus tells Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. Jesus was planning something different for Jairus' daughter altogether. So if you read on, you find that Jairus was expecting a healing. Jesus goes to this house and he says, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And life comes back to her. Listen, Jairus was expecting a healing. But Jesus was planning a resurrection. What does that mean? Listen, if God always met our expectations, he would never have the opportunity to exceed them. You ever realize that? If God always met our expectations, this is how I need it done. Jesus, I need you to come to my house and heal. Jesus says, no. If he always met our expectations, he would never have the opportunity to exceed them. We need a new view of ourself, a new view of others, but we also need a new view of God. A new view of God. Listen, how many of you know that you don't have to be a Uh, a Bible student or have a a degree in biblical numerology to know that there are certain numbers in the Bible that are pretty significant to God. Um, There are numbers that are repeated all throughout that kind of act as like these biblical blues clues kind of thing where they're like, okay, he's saying this number all the time. There must be something kind of important with this number. Well, 12 is a very big number to God. 12 is a very big number to God. Uh, When God began his covenant with his people, It was a covenant that commenced with Abraham, continued with Isaac, and culminated with Jacob. Jacob had not one, not ten, but twelve sons representing the power and authority of God. Those sons would later become the twelve tribes of Israel, representing the power and authority of a nation, a nation that Babylon took over and was exiled. You remember in in the Old Testament, whenever the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies, he would have this breastplate with 12 precious stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel and represented the power and authority. How many know that in the New Testament, even in the New Testament, the the high priest who is Jesus, the first time that we see him teaching was at the tender age of 12. 12. You remember when that 12-year-old turned 30, and he was ready to pick his ministry team. He didn't have one, not 10, but 12 disciples. I would have stopped at 11. Judas would not have made the cut. But Jesus needed a betrayer too. 12 is the number of God's power and God's authority. And the passage here in Luke 8, as well as Nehemiah, and all throughout the Bible, is telling us something. It's a reminder that God has the power and the authority. And what God is trying to teach us in all these 12 kind of moments and these 12s and this 12 here, 12 there, is he's saying this. It doesn't matter if it's a blind eye, deaf ear, withered hand, issue of blood, a disease. The Babylonians have taken over. The politicians have taken over. Destroyed temple, multiple pastors and leadership, a storm, a pandemic, a virus, or death itself. He's saying there's absolutely nothing out of the jurisdiction of my power and my authority. This is what Jesus is saying saying here, this is what the word of God is saying. We need a new view of God and his power and his authority. But you know, it'd be, I get this all the time from people. It'd be easy to kind of chalk this up as like a faith problem. You just got to have more faith, right? We're really good at kind of repeating Christian rhetoric like that. Because it says your faith has healed you. Listen carefully. Faith is important. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Faith is our anchor, but it has to be tethered to something. You can't just throw an anchor out. You're going to lose that anchor. 
That anchor has to be tethered to something stable. So listen, our faith must be tethered to his power and his authority, the word of God. Jairus had a view of God. He wanted Jesus to come to his house. He's like, I have a very specific way I want this to happen. And listen, it's the only way. You want to know what every leader has in common? They think they're right. Jairus is like, come on, I'm the pastor, I'm the leader. This is the only way. I got to have you here in my house physically. I got the band and Joe ready to go. They're playing music already. You just need to show up and have a healing. This is how it has to be. I get it. The environment has to be right. The setting has to be exactly how we envisioned it. The year has to be 2022. The buildings have to be open. The sermons are not going to be on a screen. I'm not going to be taught on a screen. I'm not going to connect with people on Zoom. Uh, it has to be the way it's always been, the way I was trained to do it. That's how I view God. You remember the Roman centurion in another portion of scripture? He had a whole different view of God. He understood authority. He understood the power of God. And he goes like this. He goes, listen, I'm not worthy of you coming to my house, Jesus. You just have to speak the word. And Jesus, what did he say? I've not seen faith like this anywhere. Boom. And it was done. The woman had a whole nother view. She's like, if I could just touch. In fact, the Greek says she said within herself over and over. If I could just touch, if I could just get close enough, touch the, the little hem, the edge there of his garment, that would be enough to receive the power of God in my life for it to completely transform me. If I can just touch and be close enough to Jesus, how we view God is critical, especially in our time of need, especially when we're hurting. I find this interesting in this passage. It says that everybody was touching him. The crowd was touching him. So many people touched Jesus that day, but listen, only one received a miracle. I can't tell you how many times I have conversations with people. So many people come to church across our campuses, but very few people are blessed by it. There's all kinds of people that come. Crowds are coming to touch the service, to experience something, but only a few actually get something out of it. Why is that? We need a new view of God. We need a new view of God. We need a new view of self, of God, and of others. Let me finish this up. Let me close this up. Nehemiah. He kind of wraps up in Nehemiah chapter 2. He's ready to go. He, he, he had, and then he's hurting, and now he's ready to heal and bring a word to the people. And in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, then he says this. Then I said to them, that's the people, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me. What does that mean? New view of God. And what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Our view of God should never be limited to our surroundings. God can do anything, anytime, anywhere with anyone. God is able. He is the God of the impossible. And Jesus can change it all. Our church for decades had something wonderful and great. We're in a season right now. There's a pandemic. Things are turning over. We were hurting and we're stepping into this healing season. And something brand new is beginning. Let, let me add this. Most of the time in the Bible, when Jesus performed a miracle, listen, he usually heads toward that victim to perform the miracle. In this case, Jesus was not heading in the woman's direction. Listen very carefully to this. He was not heading in the direction of the woman. In this case, his back was turned to her. His back was turned to her. Have you ever felt that? We're like, everything you pray, everything you're doing, 
It's like God's back is to you. The organization you lead, the business you lead, the family you lead. It's like, God, Jesus, where are you? Like he's not listening. Like he's heading in a completely different direction to do other things and bless other people. Like he doesn't even care about our situation. But see, there's a correlation with the woman and the destination he was heading with Jairus, his daughter. Listen, the interruption was really a divine interweaving of both the woman and Jairus' daughter. Listen, one was a young girl, the other a mature woman. One, Jesus was going to, the other, Jesus was walking away from. The year the woman was diagnosed with her issue was the same year the girl was born. As the affliction grew in the woman, the little girl grew into her condition. He gives life back with the woman and he loses life with the little girl. One is the coming generation that seems close to death. The other, a mature generation, but is hemorrhaging and losing blood and strength. And in all the chaos and the fear and the loss and the confusion, it is Jesus who stands in the center of it all. In all of it. To say not only can he heal the former, he can resurrect the latter. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Everything was made by him and for him. And in him, all things can hold together. Both generations need to know that Jesus is still touching lives. And that the power of God is still available and accessible to all. That 2020 and 2021 did not destroy us. It made us desperate for him. That our identity is not wrapped up in what goes on in and through the struggles and the difficulty and the change and the surroundings. It doesn't get wrapped up in that. And that when others are blessed, when other churches are blessed, when other neighborhoods and neighbors and family and friends are blessed, we don't become bitter We become better for it. And we're excited because he's a good, good father. And he's blessing people. He is still at work. And when the impossible happens, and everyone is telling you to stop, stop praying, stop worshiping, stop attending, stop engaging, we remember that God is still on the throne. And we don't need to be afraid Just believe because he's the one with the authority and the power. And one day, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord of all. Come on, let's stand together and sing this.
Hey, thank you so much for being here with us today. If you're brand new, I'd love to meet you. Our team would love to meet you. We got a free gift for you just to say thanks for joining us. And uh, we're excited about our uh, new year that we're going into. We also have uh, Welcome to Willow coming up in a couple of weeks if you want to find out more about our mission, vision, values and get a behind the scenes look at what God is doing and where we're going as a church. Uh, you're going to want to get a, be a part of that. Welcome to Willow. So thank you for being here. Have a great rest of your week. We'll see you next Sunday.